Okay, everybody. So I think there are enough of us here to uh, begin this evening. Our main, uh, our main show starts in half an hour. And um, we, uh, we begin this event uh, early before it's a pre-panel event. So we can uh, have a general conversation uh, prior to that. So my name is Lee Recco. Thank you for all joining us here this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. Uh, I'd like to begin by gratefully acknowledging the numerous Indigenous peoples of Turtle Island, what we call North America, as past, present and future caretakers of these lands. The Wright Ingram Institute has its roots in the homelands of the Ute, Cheyenne, Apache and Hikaria peoples, the areas we call Colorado Springs and Running Creek, Colorado. Although our institute operates remotely, our offices are based in the homelands of the Lenape people on the lands we know as Brooklyn, New York. I also wish to acknowledge the Seminole and Miccosukee tribes who steward the, Ever steward the Everglades where I'm speaking from tonight. And the Sioux, Cherokee and Iroquois peoples who are the traditional stewards of the place we now call Vermont, where my colleague is joining me from this evening and the ancestral homes and territories of the Ute, Apache, Hopi, Zuni today and the Pueblos peoples of the southwestern US where we're preparing to host uh, Wright Ingram's upcoming field stations and study tank programs. I'd like to thank all the board members of the Wright Ingram Institute, Anna Grady from our grants program joining us here, Kevin Bone and all of our field station staff and associates, uh, particularly Lily Raphael tonight who's put this panel together. Um, I'd like to uh, sincerely thank our panel participants, who will, some of whom are here and others who will be joining us shortly. So I'm honoured to be here with you as Executive Director of the Wright Ingram Institute at this third Field Station Speaker Series event that interrogates notions of design, ecology and justice. Tonight, we will also give you some insight into our grants program, a program that is approaching almost a decade of giving. Uh, for our institute. Uh, I'm toasting this evening, every week we have a toast and uh, every month we have a toast and I'm toasting this evening with Anna Grady, who's the director of our grants program. So uh, if you have a, a, a drink with you, please raise your glass, but Anna, I'll drink with you tonight. My, my glass always sort of disappears <laughs> into the background ether, but cheers. Cheers. Now let's drink to our um, institute and the programs that live at the junctions of research, learning and grant giving. <clears throat> so the nonprofit sector is a sizable and highly dynamic component of economies and societies throughout North America and the world. Uh, nonprofit organisations or NPOs are often described as third sector organisations since they are private entities that pursue public interests, needs or concerns by raising and giving resources, by designing and providing services and by encouraging empowerment and participation. The expectations placed upon NPOs raise fundamental stresses such as the capacity to deliver to the various communities that they serve through their ability to create value. The effectiveness of NPOs often relies to a substantial degree on receiving grants. It's important to understand that grant money supports and augments the development of specific knowledge building frameworks and actions that enable nonprofits to pursue high value added activities. Grants can provide not only crucial financial support, but obtaining one grant almost certainly leads to the ability to be successful at obtaining more. Grants also boost organisational morale, a critical element in any working environment. So in short, grants are essential to the nonprofit world. And I'm so proud of the Wright Ingram Institute's grant giving arm. Uh, we support organisations that are working courageously on ways to conserve and preserve the integrity of our planet and those in need, both human and non-human, in multiple ways. We welcome all organisations that meet our criteria and eligibility requirements to apply through our annual open call. Recipient organisations must be registered 501c3s and be able to receive funds in US dollars, even though the work they conduct may take place outside of the United States. 
Our criteria covers organisations working at the intersection, at any intersection of climate change, conservation, ecosystem protections, land use issues, sustainability, human security, renewable energy and food. But I won't talk any more about it. Um, I'll leave that up to our program director, who's much more succinct and articulate at speaking about the grants program. Therefore, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce Anna Grady, board member of the Wright Ingram Institute and director of its grants program. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much, Lee. And what a pleasure it is to join everybody tonight. Um, my name is Anna Grady. I live in Vermont and I've been associated with the Wright Ingram Institute for a very long time uh, back in the early days, as well as most recently uh, when we got our restart uh, about 10 years ago. And I've been particularly interested in the grants program and just uh, finding ways to extend the Institute's reach beyond what we are doing in the organization to other very interesting and dynamic um, institutes and organizations that are doing similar work to our mission. Um, so I'm delighted to share a little bit of information with you tonight about that. Um, as, as Lee said, we have uh, been measuring our impact in terms of the amount of dollars that we have given away. Uh, so far, we have uh, successfully given more than $350,000 to more than 60 organizations around the world. And for me, that is uh, equal to impact. That is something measurable. It's something concrete. It is uh, something that we can be very proud of uh, learning about what other organizations are doing in the world that uh, align with our mission and not just align with it, but extend it beyond our reach. Uh, we give uh, grants to organizations or projects that are focused on <laughs> that was on the previous slide. Amish, you might want to go back one slide. Um, uh, so there are three areas. There's climate change, which is uh, really about actively solving problems of how to bring clean air and water to global communities how to prevent or stem natural disasters and meteorolo meteorological events, and how to best promote sustainable practices and support renewable sources of energy. The land issues is a second category. This is about looking at ways to apply concepts of sustainability, including ways to reverse the loss of fragile ecosystems that we read about every day, that connect people and animals with land, and that work at the nexus of food, fuel, and shelter a concept that was integral at the very beginning stages of the Institute's form, uh, formation many years ago, very interested in the intersection of food, fuel, and shelter, and uh, in seeking, uh, seeking ways to better understand how these human systems and natural systems intersect with one another. And the third issue, uh, the third area is wildlife conservation. Uh, looking at, at, at ways to conserve and preserve important wildlife habitats around the world as globalization continues to seek to develop to develop every corner of this globe with human impact and, uh, and human presence, um, what happens to the wildlife habitats in that process. So we are keenly interested in that in solving those problems, or at least talking about them. Our grants are small, but they're impactful. Um, they are in the form of $5,000 grants and $10,000 grants. And we found that this amount can make a, a very big difference, especially with startup uh, projects or small organizations that are looking for matching grants. The two largest grants are $10,000 each. Um, there's one that is named for Elizabeth Wright Ingram, who was the founder of the Wright Ingram Institute. Uh, so to give you an example of one of the recipients that, uh, that got one of those grants, uh, in 2019, we gave $10,000 to the Women in Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy uh, Organization, it's otherwise known as RISE, W-R-I-S-E. And this was in support of women trying to break into the field of renewable energy. Renewable energy, like most of the energy and utilities industries, are very male dominated still. So really finding ways to help women learn the technical skills and become uh, knowledgeable about this industry was really important to us and seemed relevant to our mission. Um, the RISE mission is to build community, promote education, and cultivate leadership through the actions of women. And so our grant 
provided some scholarship funds for women to attend the annual Global Wind Energy Conference to learn more about the industry. And when, when we got the impact report back from that organization, they were just thrilled. Um, and they were so proud to be able to uh, provide that scholarship money for those uh, two women to go. The second $10,000 grant, and I won't talk about all of these grants, but I think these are the two biggest and, and worth uh, highlighting. The second $10,000 grant is the Richard T. Parker grant, which was dedicated uh, to Richard Par T. Parker, who was an alumnus of the Institute's Running Creek Field Station program. This grant is awarded to an organization conducting research in the fields of science, wildlife, and environmental education. We also uh, give away about sometimes between four and six sustaining grants uh, at the amount of $5,000 each. And these grants are awarded to a range of organizations really kind of crossing all three of those criteria areas. Uh, let me give you just an example of one of those. In 2017, we gave $5,000 to the OWL Research Institute. This institute, which was started in 1988, is dedicated to owl conservation through research and education. They conduct field research, scientific studies, and offer educational programs to better understand the habitats of owls. Today, they are one of the most premier owl research in centers around the world. We feel very proud that we have been one of their donors. Um, another one of the organizations that I I personally am most proud of is the KTK Belt in Nepal. Uh, this is a fascinating project um, and an organization uh, that's dedicated to training local farmers in Nepal. So this is a good example of a global grant um, that's not based here in the United States. Um, and they are, they're training local farmers to learn about the land and then teach others in order to grow the agricultural expertise and capacity within the country. KTK Belt's mission, and I think that if you look at the chat, they're probably posting the websites in the chat uh, function here. KTK Belt's mission is to catalyze new models of biodiversity conservation and environmental learning in Eastern Nepal. The idea is to give a framework to local farmers to become professors of their vertical university. And if you've been to Nepal, which I have not, but I've read a lot about it, is that Nepal is very mountainous. And so there's very interesting layers of agricultural land and diversity at different um, elevations of the country. And so they're training local farmers to become experts in uh, one of their areas, one of the layers of the mountainous areas, and then train other local farmers um, to share their indigenous knowledge and look for ways for conserving threatened species and landscapes. It's a fascinating project and organization and still going very strong. Um, so tonight, uh, we are very pleased to welcome another one of our, the recipients of our grant program, and that is Marcy Bidwell from the Mountain Studies Institute. Um, the Mountain Studies Institute focuses on connecting scientists and stakeholders uh, across the San Juan Mountains uh, to better understand the environment. And at this time, I'd like to hand the microphone off to Marcy um, to speak more about the impact that the Institute grant had on the uh, Mountain Studies Institute. Marcy? <laughs> I think you might be on mute, Marcy. Thank you very much for the uh, gracious introduction. And I am honored to be here to be part of this discussion tonight. Um, let me share a view of my homeland and begin with gratitude to Wright Ingraham Institute for having me join you this evening. And also gratitude to the San Juan Mountains and the communities that have um, elected me to serve as executive director of Mountain Studies Institute. Um, our name evokes the landscape, but the true beauty and value of our organization is not just the landscape, but the people within it. Um, hold on one second. Let's push some buttons. Are you sharing my screen now? Yes. It's going to be a little bit slow. 
Um, we'll give it some time to think. So Mountain Studies Institute is, is, was founded in the San Juan Mountains, and we would like to begin by acknowledging that our roots here are, uh, that we are founded in honor of lands that are historic and current homelands for the, the Ute Mountain Ute people, the Southern Ute people, the Diné, the um, Pueblos, and the other communities um, that are here. Please let me know if you can see the screen yet. It's showing blank on my side. Yes. Give me one second. Let me try that one more time. Okay. Going back to sharing. Now I think we're on. Can you see a uh, landscape now? Fantastic. Um, when you think of Colorado, many people think of the mountains and the blue skies. Um, that are part of our namesake. But we are actually very much a community of people that live here. And it is the intermixing of those systems, the full uh, systems approach um, that really ties us together. As I uh, now, uh, mentioned, uh, we'd like to begin with acknowledgement and gratitude to the communities um, that in which uh, have lived and continue to live in these sacred lands um, and that are continuing vibrant and strong communities. Also gratitude for the water and the mountains and the forest which enrich our lives and, and inspire us. And uh, for the communities that work with us on a daily basis and invite my organization um, in to help them address um, some of these big pressing problems of our times. Uh, Mount Studies Institute mission is to empower communities, managers, and scientists to work together to innovate solutions through mountain research, uh, education, and practice. And we, in the last few months, have renewed our uh, strategic plan to focus on advancing mountain science, empowering communities, and innovating solutions. Uh, we think of ourselves as developing science that people can use to help us live sustainably on the landscape. Our impact in the area is by working together um, to bring people to help identify the values that matter most to our communities and to uh, figure out both challenges and opportunities where we can excel in the future um, and bring good science to help guide us through uh, navigating to the future. We lead um, initiatives to address those questions and to put good work onto the ground by doing uh, water sampling, science research, restoration, and stewardship projects. We have doubled down, we say, on forests, water, and climate, and the intersections of those with our community. In the last year, we have been honored to be selected as a Wright Ingraham Institute grantee. And this grant and funding has really helped support our ability to continue to work on the land in, in spite of and also inspired by the challenges that COVID brings to us layered on top of um, the world that we have already faced. And so the grant has enabled us to um, expand that community and to be able to invest in new ways of community, of communicating and reaching our community members, um, those that are young and those that are young of heart. We're super excited that through also our relationship with getting to know the Wright Ingram Institute, that we will be partnering with the field stations in 2022. And through the conversations and the relationships and um, authentic journeys through our watersheds, uh, we're looking forward to being a part of this course. The, the course will begin in Albuquerque and travel up the Rio Grande, cross over the divide and into the San Juan, and then travel down the watershed uh, to the many communities on the Colorado Plateau. We invite you to learn more about this course, and uh, I want to just extend my gratitude to all of those who recently came and visited us um, here in Southwest Colorado, um, New Mexico, as a part of planning this trip, and also gratitude to those that met with us. The, part, the real important piece that we've learned about the field stations through our conversations is the importance of authentic relationships of bringing the field stations to our area to help support students both from here and who are interested in here to unite the sciences, the design world, and uh, the communities in which we are all inspired by it. And to make sure that it is 
um, a cooperative framework and um, exchange, as well as an authentic partnership, which benefits all who are involved. And we're really grateful to the Wright Ingraham Institute. Thank you. Hi, so thank you, Marcy, so much, and thank you, Anna. Um, I'm so excited to, to listen to, um, to Marcy speak and also to Anna. Um, and I'd like to also um, mention that we have, we're trying to build these sorts of collaborations with other organisations that we've received grant, that who have received grants in the past in very organic ways. Um, a lot of this connects with the field stations program, such as their uh, growing cooperative uh, alliance with the sustainability lab, and more generally, um, a, a sort of an, a newer a sort of advisory flow coming from uh, headwaters economics, um, both past recipients of our program, of our grants program. So I hope you've enjoyed learning a little about our grants program tonight and some of the organisations that the institutes help support. Um, please check out our website to learn more about it. And if you're eligible to apply for our 2022 round of grant giving, um, I, I encourage you to do so. Um, please continue to join us on November 10th for our next Field Station Speaker Series event on the, top of, on the topic of energy and extraction. Um, toward the end of the month, we'll be announcing this year's um, Wright Ingram's grant recipients. Um, so stay tuned for uh, to our social media posts, both about our upcoming event, our speaker series events, and our social media posts and emails for the exciting announcement, announcements about this year's uh, grants awards. Um, I'd also um, like to uh, just talk a little about grants uh, some more. Um, so to orchestrate or support a conservation project, a scientific innovation, a social or environmental justice achievement, an integrated educational experience or a research project, or just the day-to-day -day organisational operations or an NPO requires a huge amount of support. An organisation must be able to grow and maintain capacity if value creation is to flourish. Building skills, knowledge and commitment of board, staff and other partners and experts alike in a culture of organisational care is a tremendous challenge and a tremendous achievement. Our organisation is a small non-profit. Our programs and operations are funded by our modest endowment, which relies entirely uh, on socially and environmentally responsible investments. Our returns allow us to manage our operations, provide for our grant giving program and pledge matching funds to run our field stations and study tank programs. Our own fundraising activities requires us to engage in grant writing efforts, but moreover relies on people like you, our potential donors, large and small, to give what they can in support of our research, gifting and educational initiatives. This coming year, we continue to ask for your support to help fund our study tank research program to build and share knowledge with our stakeholders in the region and our 2022 in-person field stations are slated to take place in the Southwest in the, in the coming summer. Uh, this provides a uh, very targeted intensive to young intensives to young leaders and environmentally focused influences by giving them a foundational opportunity to immerse themselves in a living lab environment with a host of knowledgeable faculty and partners to expand how they see the world around them and how they might act in it. We also recognise that we can't do everything at Wright Ingram, which is why our grants program is so important. It works on building reach uh, through uh, these partnerships. Uh, therefore, we're offering naming rights this year to any donor who wishes to support a new grant to enable us to expand our giving program. 
So I do hope you can give a little to Wright Ingram Institute in whatever capacity is possible. Our activities also provide an opportunity to continue panels like our Field Station Speaker Series that's about to begin this evening. Perhaps you might be able to give a very small donation next time you register for an event. Perhaps you have the ability to fund the Speaker Series in entirety. Whatever contribution you offer, it's never too big or too small and we'll be always gratefully received. And we also ask you to think of us on Giving Tuesday this year on November 30th. So giving creates a bond. It helps to bolster relationships through shared missions, goals and values that may otherwise not be possible. Many of you or your family members might already be giving or volunteering to causes that are important to you and we applaud you for that. Working together on what is meaningful to us in all its different ways can only help us make have more positive impact. So I ask you this year to consider giving to the Wright Ingram Institute and the work that we do. I also invite you to participate in our institute in other ways contribute to our photo galleries, apply to our 2022 grants call or our summer field stations program, uh, or consider donating directly to us through our website. It's now my great pleasure to um, invite you to join us for tonight's field station speaker series panel on the topic of rooted futures, land, food, and water sovereignty. Uh, thank you very much. We do have a couple of minutes, so perhaps as if anybody has put a question in the in the chat window, perhaps uh, Lily Raphael, who's organised this panel, uh, could offer um, some uh, something in in response to that. If it's about the upcoming panel, or uh, perhaps Anna can can answer something if it's related to our grants program. Thanks so much. Well, Lee, shall I go ahead and start? We have two minutes until it's six o'clock, but you're in charge now. So. All right, I'm going to wait two minutes. I will take advantage of this time just to say hello to everyone. It's nice to see you all again. Hi, Marcy. Thanks again for your wonderful, wonderful hospitality. It was fantastic. It was fantastic to have all five of you come and visit us. And I have to say, it's been a bit lonely um, <laughs> not having a whole pile of people uh, driving around. And I can also successfully report um, you may have seen photos uh, from the second uh, visit to the Mancus River restoration site with the Mute Mountain Mute Tribe since you visited. We have installed our, um, our One Rock Dam uh, that you all helped us to prepare the site for. So thank you for that. Your mark has been made. We look forward to your return. Excellent. Well, I think we're good to go. Um, and I would, uh, I will begin by introducing myself. I'm Kevin Bone. I work with the Wright Ingram Institute. I have been affiliated with my beloved colleagues, the Wright Ingram Institute for 40 plus years here. It's my privilege to work on these projects. Um, I wanna begin by thanking my colleagues on the board um, by thanking our new executive director, Lee Recal, You're doing a fabulous job, Lee. Thank you so much. Um, my colleagues on the Field Stations Project, everyone is working hard. Uh, it's not easy. We're moving forward. And I would also especially like to thank the fabulous panel that Lily has put together tonight. The details of the introduction of the panelists, I'm going to leave in Lily Raphael's hands. For my introduction, I would just like to share a short little anecdotal story, please. Um, Amos, can we have the next slide? So I'm gonna share a little short reading from Eduardo Galeano. The car coughed and sputtered. Inside, packed tight and bouncing about, was a band of musicians. They were on their way to enliven a gathering of poor farmers. But for a while they had been lost on the boiling roads 
of Argentina's Santiago del Estero. Bereft of bearings, they had no one to ask. Nobody, not a soul, remained in that desert that had once been a forest. Suddenly, out of a cloud of dust, a girl on a bicycle appeared. How much farther, they asked. Less, she said. And off she went into the dust. Galliano is the author of work that is regarded as a decolonizing pedagogical canon, including his seminal work, Open Veins of Latin America. This little piece is from his book, Children of the Days. To me, this little piece projects a special reading of hope. We can be understood as all travelers in a desert that was once a forest, that we might see ourselves as bereft of bearings. But we are told by the ch child in the story, when asked how much farther, her reply, less. To me, this inspires hope. We are moving forward. It signals that we are progressing forward. It's a really important message. You know, I work with a lot of young students. I have children my own, and there's a lot of despair that the problems are so large and so insurmountable that we can make no progress. But I see it differently. I think we're making wonderful progress. And I believe Lily's, Lily Raphael's involvement in the Reitinger Institute is evidence that we are moving forward. The Reitinger Institute has been idea, introduced to ideas such as land acknowledgments, decolonization, um, and, and these are terms that are new to some of us. Some of us didn't know these ideas a couple of years ago. So that in itself is remarkable progress. That is really evidence that we are moving forward. Some of us might be uncomfortable with some of these terms, but Lily has made it her mission and we have made it her job assignment really to introduce us to the ideas of land acknowledgements, to discuss race, equity, and decolonization in working groups with the board. Um, this is all fantastic progress for this little organization. Um, so I'm grateful to where we are. I'm grateful to the progress that we're making, and I am grateful to be a part of this organization. So with that, uh, and again, thanks to my colleagues and the support that the board gives us all, I would like to hand this over to the moderator for tonight's event, Lily Reppel. Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us um, wherever you are, maybe afternoon or evening. Um, as Kevin mentioned, my name is Lily Raphael. I am of black Louisiana Creole ancestry on my father's side and on my mother's um, or Irish and German settler ancestry. I was born and raised in the Hopewell, Adena, Mamia, and uh, Shawnee um, territories um, in, in and around Cincinnati, Ohio. And I currently live on the unceded, unsurrendered, and ancestral homelands of the Honkaminam and Squamish Neecham speaking peoples of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples, also known as Vancouver, BC. And I'm very honored to be here as a guest and to learn from and stand in solidarity with those who have cared for these lands since time immemorial. Um, a little bit about me, I'm a community planner and educator uh, working deliberately in the realm of systems transformation um, and continuously asking this question of how we need to be in relationship to ourselves, um, each other and um, all beings in order to move away from the dominant system that undermines planetary well-being. Um, I'm also uh, an alum of the 2019 Field Stations program in Colombia, and currently supporting the Field Stations program related to curriculum development um, for the upcoming program. And as Kevin mentioned in the beginnings of um, embedding principles of equity and decolonization into the organization to guide current and future actions. I am grateful to the Wright Ingram Institute for continued collaboration and for hosting um, important events such as these. Um, I'm really excited and incredibly humbled to welcome our panelists who will be joining us uh, for this panel entitled Rooted Futures, Land, Food and Water Sovereignty. All of these panelists have many roles related to indigenous sovereignty in the Southwest. Um, they're academics, farmers, sea keepers, executive directors, land and water protectors, knowledge keepers, 
um, and they're amazing women that are leading community driven and ancestrally rooted land, food and water initiatives that challenge and resist systems of, oppress of oppression, such as settler colonialism and extractivism. And they're prioritizing well being for current and future generations of humans and more than humans, which is critical given the ongoing and immediate crises that we are facing. And I'm um, very excited to be learning from all of you um, and to hear from your perspectives on, um, on what your work is and um, on, on these issues of sovereignty in your communities. Um, so I'll go quickly through some introductions to our panelists and then I'm going to let them speak more deeply as they go through their presentations. Um, but it's really my pleasure to welcome um, Teresa Montoya, um, a social scientist and media maker and postdoctoral fellow at University of Chicago, focusing on legacies of environmental contamination in relation to contemporary issues of tribal jurisdiction, regulatory politics, water security and public health on the Navajo Nation. Julia Bernal of Sandia Pueblo, director of the Pueblo Action Alliance and graduate student working towards her master's in water resource policy management and a master's in community regional planning at the University of New Mexico. She advocates for the decolonization of water policy and stolen water resources, along with her, um, with her organizations that she works with. And also we have Tiana Suazo of Taos Pueblo and the executive director of Red Willow Center of Taos Pueblo, whose mission is to reclaim the agricultural heritage of the Taos Pueblo and restore traditional food systems. She's also a member of the Young Farmers Coalition. And Lillian Hill, um, who's Ketchan and Hopi, a mother, farmer, natural builder, and community organizer uh, who practices and promotes the ancestral life ways of her people while actively working to nurture a new generation of indigenous land stewards. She's also the executive director of the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance and the Hopi Tutsqua Permaculture Institute. There's so much more I could say about each of them. And um, as I said, I'll let them each introduce themselves more deeply and also encourage the audience to reread their bios. Um, again, I'm really appreciative that you could all could join us and I'm very excited to um, just be in a position of learning from all of you. In terms of the format, before we begin, I just wanted to um, note that we'll be hearing um, each panelist present about their work and then go into a moderated discussion and question and answer period. Um, so at that time, the audience can pose questions into the chat and then myself or Ariel will read those aloud or you can also raise your hand to ask yourself, um, to ask the question yourself. So we will post some of those resources in the chat and a list of resources uh, will be sent out to those who registered um, following the panel. So without further ado, it's um, my honor to pass the uh, screen to Teresa Montoya, who will be talking on her work. Good afternoon, yacht everyone. I'm going to share screen now. This is showing up. It's the full um, slide showing. Um, we can this one, you hit the play button. We're able to see like half of it for some reason. It's getting better. Oh, okay. It's getting better. Mm -hmm. This is going to have to do for the time being. Um, I had horrible um, internet in my office, so I'm in my car, as you can see, and I need to have multiple screens open. Okay. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, thank you uh, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Teresa Montoya. Um, I am Diné. Tatne zan nenishle. Bilagana bashish chin ashihe dashiche ado nakai dene dashanele. My family is originally from Windrock, Arizona. Um, I'm a resident now of Chicago, Illinois, where I teach at the University of Chicago. And um, yeah, I'm just honored to be here um, with all of you to provide a little bit of historical context for these 
larger issues of environmental injustice and contamination in the indigenous Southwest. Um, so I'll begin with this image of water. Um, water is central to our being biologically. It is also um, a relative. In our Diné frameworks of relationality, many of our clans are actually named for water. Um, and as central as this is to Diné epistemology and ontology, or how we refer to as knowledge and ways of being in this world, we must also contend with the material realities of this precious so-called natural resource in an era of human-driven climate change, water insecurity, and ongoing water settlement negotiations, not to mention a legacy of nuclear exposure and hard rock mining across the Colorado Plateau and beyond. These conditions affect Diné communities across the Navajo Nation and the dozens of other tribal nations in the indigenous Southwest. Um, this image here was taken in Denejozo, Arizona, on the northern part of the Navajo Nation. Um, and there's many water wells like this um, that are artfully decorated to warn residents about um, exceedances of uranium and other contaminants in local groundwater sources. Um, so I just want to um, raise some statistics here. Um, and I'm speaking, you know, from the Navajo Nation context, but I think these apply as well. Um, to our indigenous neighbors across the Southwest. Um, so Native American households overall are 19 times more likely than white households to lack indoor plumbing. Um, disparities in access and regulation of safe drinking water are associated with health disparities for tribal and other vulnerable populations. On the Navajo Nation, there's an estimated 40% of citizens that rely on, upon hauling water, such as from this um, water well here. Um, and um, this ends up costing more, uh, 20 times more than non-Navajo non water users um, in order to obtain clean water. Um, there's also other sorts of costs associated with hauling water, um, you know, buying gas or traveling to uh, border town locales in order to purchase water from Walmart. Um, so as a result, um, you know, many residents will end up hauling water from non-regulated water sources that are for livestock only, such as this water well. Um, and these have excessive quantities of contaminants and pathogens. Um, and there's been many studies undertaken by Diné researchers um, that actually show that there's, um, you know, concerning levels of uranium and arsenic in these unregulated water sources. Um, so just looking at this map here, um, you know, this shows like the pervasive legacy of abandoned uranium mines across the Navajo Nation. And as I said, you know, this is across the entire Colorado Plateau. Um, so on the Navajo Nation specifically, there's over 500 abandoned uranium mines. Um, and this is dating to a legacy of um, the Cold War, um, which necessitated um, the, the, the settler acquisition of um, uranium for munitions production. Um, where my research is centered um, and where my family comes from is this, if you look at this arrow here, Sanders, Arizona. Um, and um, I worked with community members in trying to remediate and understand um, ex excessive quantities of uranium in their groundwater. And this is stemming from this location here, which is this, the site of the 1979 Church Rock uranium spill. Um, you know, and the, the digestion and inhalation of heavy metals is directly related to several uh, health issues such as kidney and cardiovascular disease, neurocognitive disorders, hypertension, cancer, um, and even uh, uh, studies showing diabetes. Um, so I think, um, you know, a conversation around, you know, food sovereignty and other like food security projects is um, there's a there's a perception that there's there's some sort of like personal or moral moral failure of um, indigenous people to not have an adequate diet as if um, just eating fry bread or consuming soda is the sole source of our health disparities, but actually living in, um, you know, uh, contaminated lands and waterscapes has contributed to that. So I think that's important to note with some of these like public framings of our own health issues. Um, this isn't just an image here, um, which is a beautiful rendering um, of, a, of a pregnant Diné woman. Um, 
And this also just shows like the longevity of um, uranium contamination, not only in our lands, but our bodies. So each of those um, references the half-life of uranium and where these particular um, radio, um, radioactive um, uh, molecules tend to proliferate. So for instance, radon or radium and uranium. Um, this is another image here of the um, former Department of Energy site in Shiprock, New Mexico, um, and also a sign that is warning residents um, in Dene Bazad, Navajo language about um, the risks of contamination in this site. Um, and even though there's a fence drawn around it, actually a lot of animals and birds can still get in there. So there's been um, uh, recorded instances of um, deceased animals that have been found in this site. Um, and this is actually much more secure than most of, um, sites on the Navajo Nation. There's, uh, you know, hundreds of abandoned mines that have no sort of fence or no sort of marking to indicate um, their radioactivity. Um, and I'll move here to this map, um, which is just kind of giving a, a broader rendering of the Southwest. You know, these, um, what I like about this map um, is it actually highlights um, our four uh, sacred mountains. Um, and so even though the current geopolitical boundaries of the Navajo Nation, um, you know, even though it's 27,000 square miles that we were able to secure um, beyond the original 1868 treaty, you know, our relationships to land, to what we call Denebekea, our broader homelands actually encompass uh, uh, boundaries far beyond um, what we currently call the Navajo Reservation. And this is true for all indigenous territories in the Southwest and our territories often overlap one another as we move across these spaces. Um, and our sacred mountains are also sacred to many other uh, communities in the region. Um, so I just wanted to like make note of this and as we are imagining, you know, our shared relationships to land. Um, another um, part of my research, um, which is looking at, you know, issues of environmental contamination and it, how it intersects with issues of jurisdiction and sovereignty on the Navajo Nation also centers around the 2015 Gold King Mine Spill. And, and um, you know, for those of you in the Southwest, you may uh, remember these images of uh, gold yellow water um, that overtook the Animas and San Juan rivers. Um, a lot of that imagery, um, you know, centered around Durango, but this actually had long-term consequences for Diné farming communities um, located south and west of Farmington, such as Shiprock, um, all the way down to Anath, Montezuma Creek, before the contaminants um, spilled into Lake Powell. Um, so when I was doing my research, I worked with different grassroots groups um, in trying to understand and educate uh, Diné communities about this um, increasingly obtuse landscape of, you know, scientific uh, regulations and, um, and, you know, I don't know if any of you understand the, the quantities of contaminants in your own drinking water, but if going onto the EPA website, um, it's it's very uh, like hard for any lay person to understand you know what micrograms per liter are or um, trying to understand um, you know the differences of drinking water contaminants. So part of this group um, that I was a part of, Tobin Hazil, which literally means water is our strength, it was a collective of all Dene women, um, and we held several teach-ins um, in the aftermath of the Gold King Mine Spill. Um, as I said to help communities try to understand um, these impacts, but also to help researchers, Diné researchers, um, to, to understand the risks and then the long-term impacts of these, um, of this hard rock mine spill. Um, so here's just an image here that shows um, one of these teach-ins um, and a, a representative from the Navajo Nation EPA that was sharing um, all of the data back to the community. Um, and also what I thought was um, exceptional about this Diné-led research team, uh, Carletta Chief from the University of Arizona, who's a hydrologist, is also trying to reframe a lot of these scientific um, understandings of water into uh, Diné language. Um, so for instance, um, like microgram per liter, which is the, the main way that um, the maximum contaminant level for uranium, for instance, is understood. 
um, you know, most people wouldn't understand like what that uh, quantity is. Um, but she reframed it in terms of, oh, it's one drop of water, an entire um, 50 gallon water barrel, which is the, the typical like, size of a water barrel that Diné people use for hauling water. Um, so kind of trying to have cultural and local understandings of contamination and likewise, not just framing Western science for uh, Navajo or Diné consumption, but how do we translate um, Diné understandings of water and relationships to land um, back into Western science. Um, so what I appreciated with these sorts of relationships um, was that there was trying, you know, breaching these seemingly two different opposing um, ways of understanding um, in ways that could benefit the communities um, who, but these are majority like farmers, um, you know, people who need the river and the water for their own sustenance and way of life. Um, and let's see, oh, here's an image here, just um, kind of an aftermath of the spill, you know, communities came together. Um, and, you know, you'll note here, um, August 2016 is when mobilizations at Standing Rock were just taking ground. So this, this um, phrase that became so well known in um, national and global media, water is life, you know, that was already something that um, you know, folks in the in the Southwest were using not just around water contamination, but for um, uh, mobilizations for indigenous water rights. Um, so in Dene, you know, it's toh e'ena, water is life, um, and um, you know, I this still has a lot of resonance today um, with these communities. And briefly, I want to just highlight one other um, issue. Um, so Bears Ears, um, which is located in southeastern Utah, um, which is sacred to many tribes in the region, um, not just Diné, um, but in, in the, the recent restoration of the National Monument um, by Biden, I think we can all sigh a, a collective relief that um, this, at least for the time being, ensures some level of protection um, from rampant resource extraction, um, because when uh, Trump undid the original designation in 2016, it opened up a lot of that land to potential extraction. And I'll just show this map here. So here's the Bears Ears National Monument. And um, you can see White Mesa Mill, which is the last remaining um, active um, uranium mill site in the entire United States, is located just adjacent to White Mesa Ute community um, and the Navajo Nation. Um, and there's also a, a, an inactive uranium mine here that's within the Bears Ears boundaries. Um, so, you know, the legacy of uranium contamination in the form of, you know, um, a contamination of our groundwater sources, um, you know, that's still an ongoing issue. Um, so, you know, just remain vigilant to these current policies right now, like such as, um, you know, things such as green energy, which I think are seen as, um, you know, uh, a good alternative to the so-called, you know, dirty, dirty fossil fuel industry of coal. Um, a lot of that actually is pro-nuclear. So, um, you know, there has to be other energy sources that we are imagining um, for a clean future for all of us. Um, because if they start, um, you know, this, this pro-nuclear, pro-green energy agenda, um, certainly it will rely on uranium resources from the indigenous Southwest. And we've seen, we're continuing to live through the legacy of that from the Cold War. Um, so with the little time I've left, I just wanted to um, end with this slide really quickly. These are different groups um, that I support. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing from um, our other panelists who I think could provide a lot more on the ground context. Um, I just wanted to provide this very quick overview of some of the environmental justice um, issues that are affecting all of us and the ways that we can point to indigenous knowledge for helping to address these issues. Thank you so much, Teresa. That was great. And also amazing that you did that from your car. <laughs> <laughs> I think <you> must. <laughs> um, that was really great. And um, it would be great to share the uh, last slide to our guests so that they know which um, 
initiatives and organizations to follow that uh, you're supporting. And um, next up, I will introduce um, Julia Bernal from Pueblo Action Alliance. Okay, thank you, Lily. Um, hello, good afternoon. Um, my name is Julia Bernal. Um, and I'm looking forward to presenting a little bit about um, our work with Pueblo Action Alliance and some of the thoughts that I've also provided in terms of our campaign around um, land back and water back. Um, and so I'll go ahead and just make sure I have my presentation up and ready to go. Um, and yeah, thank you. One sec. All right, can folks see my screen? Okay, thank you. Let me just hit present. Okay, so um, as mentioned before, my name is Julia Bernal. I'm the director of PAA or Pueblo Action Alliance, and we're a um, we're a grassroots Pueblo centric organization. Um, organizing in Southern Tiwa territory, um, which is the homelands of my people, um, the ancestral Tiwa speaking people that are um, now from Sandia and Asleta Pueblo. Um, and what is so-called Albuquerque is um, our original territories. And so we or predominantly organize in this area, but um, our work definitely does spread across um, more of the northern state or northern northern part of the state of New Mexico. Um, we focus a lot on environmental injustices um, and the uh, and of course the associated social injustices as well. Um, I think what's really vital and integral to indigenous perspectives is that we really do bring intersectionality to any sort of movement space. Um, and so there's been a lot of on the ground work in terms of narrative shifts around um, land and body violence. Um, so, you know, uh, conversations about what happens to the land, you know, also happens to us as we are directly um, and spiritually and culturally tied to our landscapes that we are from. Um, which is sometimes a concept that's a little bit hard for um, non-Indigenous people to understand because um, it's not, it, it, you know, we, we only really share that connection with this landscape because this is where we're originally from. We've been here for thousands of years. Um, so we're, um, we're a pretty small operation, but um, we always say we're small but mighty. Um, as a lot of Pueblo people are, <laughs> um, and uh, predominantly a younger organization. So everyone in our organization is um, under the age of 35, I believe. And um, we focus a lot on protecting the greater Chaco region. Um, and I, I just um, wanted to share a little bit about that effort before I kind of get into more of our uh, water work because um, this really is um, an important pillar in our organization. And we just actually came back from the week of action in Washington, DC, um, the people versus fossil fuels, which was a, um, which is led by a coalition um, called the Build Back Fossil Free Coalition, organizations from all over the so-called US and indigenous grassroots organization who um, essentially, were was created to hold the Biden administration accountable for um, his climate initiatives that he had uh, versed at the beginning of his administration. You know, he deemed himself as the climate president, but um, we're already into October um, and new land parcels are scheduled to be auctioned off in February 2022. Um, the greater Chaco region is heavily impacted by oil and gas infrastructure. Um, you know, as was spoken in the last presentation, there is just a legacy of extractive industries throughout the Southwest region. Um, and it makes it a lot, it makes our fight a lot harder because, you know, we're, we're not just pipe fighting pipelines or that other type of, you know, infrastructure that may be geographically concentrated in one spot. I mean, we're talking about a whole landscape that is, um, ha that has, 
you know, 40,000 wells, whether those are active, abandoned, or inactive. Um, and so there, there's a whole historical legacy that we're trying to address from the grassroots level. Um, but this was one of our hype videos that we had made um, before we went out to um, DC, but I just thought I would share it with y'all to give a little bit more perspective of the region that we're organizing in. When you come to Chaco, you immediately feel all the power that's here. You feel the prayers and all the blessings that our ancestors put here. In the walls is our ancestors' sweat and breath, and it's our right to continue to put in the same breath and sweat protecting this space. The area outside the park boundaries is deemed a national energy sacrifice zone, and as a result, there are over 40,000 oil and gas wells in this region alone. Today's executive order also directs the sector of the interior to stop issuing new oil and gas leases on public lands wherever possible. We're gonna review and reset the oil and gas leasing program. But Biden has not kept his promise to end new fossil fuel leases on public lands. So October 11th through the 15th, the front lines are demanding that Biden end the fossil fuel extraction era. Join us October 11th through the 15th for a week of action as we physically confront the Biden administration and the false promises that he had given to indigenous people, for Pueblo people, for Diné people, for other indigenous people. This fight is more than just protecting our earth mother, protecting our water mothers. It's about protecting our cultural integrity. It's about protecting knowledge for future generations. And so that way indigenous people across the globe can continue to protect our landscape and our culture from the violence that's perpetuated by modern day colonialism. Okay, so, um, sorry, hold on one sec, go to the next slide. Um, so the, you know that's just a little look into one of the campaigns that we lead. We are we've been a part of the Frakov Chaco Coalition for some years now, um, but being a Pueblo Indigenous person and you know coming from various different landscapes throughout northern parts of New Mexico, um, you know, and as seen represented here, we we're all from different Pueblos, and therefore there's going to be different sets of issues. And so, a lot of our um, organizations' um, responsibilities to our communities is to also provide um, access to information and education um, that allows for community members to be. Um, have that opportunity to participate in, in environmental justice movements and indigenous resistant movement spaces um, to really think deeply of what it, it's going to take in order for us to truly decolonize from this system that has repressed um, indigenous people's exploited labors from, you know, um, the global majority. And so we're, we're essentially um, working to provide several different types of spaces, materials, toolkits to, you know, bring back to our communities to really think about, okay, what is it going to take um, in order for us to begin this undoing of colonialism. Um, and so this is our staff, a lot of young folks, uh, and a lot of awesome people that I'm really truly um, honored to work with, and hopefully we'll be bringing on more people soon. Um, and so just real quickly, I can go over our framework, but um, I would just encourage those that are more interested in our organization to check out our website at publicactionalliance.org. Um, there you'll find several different other materials that talks about um, points of unity, our traditional core values, and you know other other types of avenues for information about what we've been working on currently. Um, so as mentioned before, we're a grassroots organization, but we're really trying to promote like these ideas around cultural sustainability and community defense. So these concepts that we can do for ourselves, we can speak for ourselves, and we can also build and plan for ourselves as well. Um, our knowledge hasn't always been deemed as um, scientific or maybe held at the same caliber that Western academia um, houses, but you know, essentially that's part of the decolonial work is to re is the resurgence of indigenous identity into 
thinking spaces. Um, and so we're, we're essentially trying to do that by also addressing um, the injustices that we are that are perpetuated against us in our own communities and cultural landscapes. Um, and we do this by remembering our history and retelling our history. And so within our vision, we really do speak about um, the legacy that are of our ancestors who resisted against um, the Spanish Inquisition, and that is the Pueblo Revolt of 1680. Um, this was a mass direct action against Spanish conquest um, where Pueblos joined together to um, fight off physically fight and confront um, Spanish rule and Spanish policy um, to have to again fight for that resurgence of our indigenous identity. And so we bring that spirit of the 1680 Pueblo revolt into our organizing spaces and hope that this is a tool that also mobilizes Pueblo people to join us in this in this fight to dismantle systems around white supremacy, capitalism, imperialism, patriarchy, and of course extractive, extractive colonialism, which has been plagued throughout the Southwest. Um, and so we do that through different or through several uh, principles. Um, you had seen in the video earlier that we um, participated in a mass direct action um, in DC that you know was confronting the Biden administration, and not just for the Greater Chaco region, but many other um, indigenous led fights across the U.S. like Line Three, Line Five. Um, you know, plastic production in the South, um, oil exports in the Gulf, in the Gulf Coast, um, and also the um, the excessive fracking in in the Arctic region. And so there's a there, you know a lot of solidarity building between indigenous frontline groups there. Um, and so you know we participate um, on that front, but also you know that's that's the last resort. We most of our work is actually very civic and ceremonial. Um, you know teaching folks how to write po protest letters, um, you know, doing educational forums. This is, this is a very common tactic in Indian country to have um, community gatherings to share information about what's directly impacting us. And then, you know, what are the tools in order for us to organize against, um, against that power? You know, what, what is our best opposition strategy? So this is a little bit of what grounds us in our work as well. Um, and so, you know, the main goal is really to decolonize and we define decolonization as the removal of European occupation and the resurgence of indigenous identity. And when I say removal, I don't mean like a physical <laughs> removal of European descendants or, or anything like that. It's literally just the systems of oppression, the cycles of oppression that have been perpetuated by European conquest and, you know, also um, you know, other systems around that, that were in the name of God that um, we can't, it, we can't just not skirt around anymore. We really need to talk about what our true history was at, in order for us to move forward and to undo, relearn, unlearn, um, you know, all of, all, all you know, um, new ways of thinking. And I think that's essentially what um, my work is trying to do. So I, I'm a, in water resources. So I really wanted to us to think about how we were really going to think about um, our water insecurity, our water issues, like, you know, here in the Southwest, um, because there's this mass land back movement, you know, we talk about land back all the time. And it's, it, it really is a movement for collective liberation of indigenous people and the reclamation of everything stolen from indigenous people. Um, but it's not about um, reclaiming property. And I, th I think this is part of like where the disconnect can be with, um, you know, uh, uh, the disconnect between indigenous worldview challenging the dominant paradigm is that land back isn't about like gaining property. It's just about um, being able to reassert certain watershed and land and cultural resource management strategies that indigenous people had been doing, you know, pre-colonial contact. And so that's where we came up with, um, you know, our, our water back campaign. So, you know, here in the Southwest, we can't have land back without water back because, you know, the issues around water in the Southwest um, have really distanced people to become involved because of its complexity. But um, once you really start to learn about water policy, and water institutions and you know how essentially it's this very polycentric um 
institutional arrangement of, of water, um, you really start to see like how broken the system is and how um, more urgent it is for indigenous people to to um, assert their uh, watershed management strategies. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm a middle real grand uh, tribal person, you know, here from San Diego Pueblo. And so um, this is really an area that I'll be predominantly working on in terms of what are going to be the better management strategies for us in the future. And so we have to think about policy. <laughs> we have to think about management. Um, and we ha really have to think about um, how, how indigenous worldview is really something beneficial for everybody. Um, and also, where are the gaps? Um, I feel like frontline communities really do don't get the um, opportunity to participate in water conversations, and and there needs to be this rematriation of um, happening within water management um, circles, think tanks, um, and and uh, you know it's bringing like this this futurism aspect, which I'll talk a little bit. Um, I probably won't be able to get through my whole presentation because it's just very in depth, but I'll be sure to drop a link of our another previous water back um, presentation that I did um, with Marcus Trujillo um, some months ago. But um, essentially what my work, I think I wanna contribute to this movement is again, that rematriation. Like what does rematriation mean actually in, um, water management strategies? Is this a tool that we can really utilize to deco deco decolonize, truly decolonize how we're looking at water resources? And so um, I feel like this is an opportunity for frontline um, fights to be more involved with how we're going to manage water in the future because grassroots movements really, I mean, the backbone of grassroots movements have been women, have been two-spirit, have been trans, have been non-binary folks. And so this concept of rematriating uh, water management strategy is something that I'm really close to and really passionate for. Um, so I, I wanna um, point folks to maybe check out our website again um, to see our water back manifesto, um, but also just understanding that this, because we have it in written word doesn't mean that this is like what we think, um, this is what we think and this is what's gonna stick. We wanna feel like, um, we wanna invite folks uh, folks to think about like how transformative water actually is. And so these concepts are ever evolving over time. And so we have to allow for that type of radical thinking in water management spaces in order for that transformation to truly happen. Um, so this is just a statement that we have from our water back manifesto. Um, and, you know, it really is about um, asserting this indigenous futurism perspective into water management strategies in, in itself. Um, one of my friends uh, from Acoma had even told me something really, um, uh, just something that really spoke to me from an elder that, you know, he was talking to. He's, he said, like, public people are so far behind, we're actually ahead you know and so this this opportunity that we have to give ourselves in terms of planning for our own futures is really this act of asserting our own birthright our inherent birthright to enjoy being indigenous to um, create solutions that are going to better our own futures and future generations behind us um, to you know, bring back the importance and integrity of traditional ecological knowledge um, you know, reassert the resurgence of indigenous worldview and also the resurgence of personhood to earth and river mothers. You know, I think that if we looked at the earth and river as living entities rather than resources, then maybe we would treat them differently and maybe we would manage them differently as well. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, a lot of um, the management strategies that, you know, I talk about is, is essentially centered around like Pueblo, rematriation and how we're going to assert that perspective back into how we're managing water 
here in the future, especially in the Southwest, because we're going to be impacted by many climate stressor stressors like rising temperatures, increased urbanization um, is actually going to be a result of climate change as people start to migrate, which is normal. I mean, that was definitely a water management strategy before uh, colonial contact, but um, because we've been situated in certain land bases for some time, it's gonna cause some issues um, in the way that land is managed and divided up now. Um, in terms of property is also going to be another issue that we're going to look to in the future. Um, so the future is indigenous, the future is women and two spirit led. And I'm just really um, thankful to have the opportunity to speak with everyone. And I can throw some links in the chat, but I definitely don't want to take up too, too much time because I could go on and on <laughs> and definitely want to hear from our other speakers. So thank you. Thank you so much, Julia. That was a great presentation. Um, I want to just quickly go ahead and um, pass the mic to Tiana Suazo. Can everyone hear me? Cool. <laughs> um, hello, everyone. My name is Tiana Suazo. Um, I am from Taos and Jemez Pueblos, and I am going to talk to you about Red Willow Center. So let me get my presentation going. Let's see. Cool. Uh, so yeah, really good to be here with everyone and share this platform with all of these amazing women. I am nice and fired up right now because man, like everything you guys are saying, I'm like, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, but just to give you a little background into Red Willow Center, I became the executive director in November of 2019, so just been doing this for a little under three years. Um, the organization started in 2000 with a grant from Building with Books and has gone through, I'll say, a roller coaster of leadership. Um, it's just been through a whole lot. It's had good times where it was really serving the community and has unfortunately experienced a lot of bad times to where this place was just serving the people who were in charge, there was embezzlement going on, and it just was not serving the community of Taos Pueblo. Um, during my first two years as executive director, I was basically cleaning up the organization with the help of some my really amazing team. Um, and in the midst of cleaning up the organization, we found at least 10 mission statements and just a bunch of craziness. There wasn't any documentation, um, no policies, basically nothing. So myself and my co-director have just been really working to build up the organization and make it an organization that directly serves the Taos Pueblo community. Um, so the mission that we found that we fe uh, felt best fit the direction in which we're heading now was what we I have here to reclaim the agricultural heritage of Taos Pueblo and restore its traditional food systems. And we do this do through three pillars of Red Willow Center, which are our farm, our farmer's market, and our youth internship programs. Um, so I'll just get into that now. And the picture you see there is just our field last year. We have Taos Pueblo corn, uh, beans and squash and some rogue asparagus that just pops up whenever it wants to. <laughs> so my presentation is all just visual. Um, th these are pictures of our farm. And this was in 2020. Uh, we have three greenhouses, two of which are heated with a district heating unit called the Garn. So this allows us to extend our season well into the fall and get a jump start into from the early spring. And so that left picture just shows two of our youth that we have in our program that are lighting our Garn system that heats up two of our greenhouses. Uh, we also have about 1.5 acres of outdoor growing space um, where we have commercial crops and traditional crops. So these are pictures of our farm. We had an amazing garlic year this year. So that's our garlic there. The bottom right corner is our traditional field with the same Taos red bean um, corn and squash. And these are just some of our photos from our greenhouses um, and our field. So all of our like farming activities are really youth involved. And the the food that we grow here, we donate to various organizations within Taos Pueblo and Ta the town of Taos. 
Uh, we also have a CSA and this fills our farmer's market. Um, since we've had the pandemic, we've and our borders have been closed basically to the outside world. <laughs> See, it's been very limited of who can come in. So we serve just the Taos Pueblo community right now. And it's actually been a blessing. Um, before the pandemic, when we were serving um, basically the general public, we hardly had any of our own community members coming to our farmer's market. Uh, but with the pandemic and our borders closing, we've just been serving the Taos Pueblo community and it's been amazing like how many people have been showing up um, and just supporting us and buying our food. And it's really just great. You know, like I visited our um, Indian Health Services recently and one of the clinicians stopped me and she's like, are you the one who's doing the farmer's market and the senior food packages? And I'm like, yeah, and she's said that she's seen improvements in the elders' health in our community. So I think that's just amazing. Um, so we have our farmer's market as well. We are open every Wednesday from 11 to 2 p.m. And right now we have three vendors from the Pueblo who have baked goods, hot food, all sorts of stuff. They sell pickled and jam um, things. And yeah, this is our main outlet to serve the Taos Pueblo community. Um, so these are just some of the um, photos that show what we sell here. Um, on the bottom left corner is um, a program that we had put together at the beginning of the pandemic to serve elder families in our community who have a lot of children living with them. Um, we just, we knew, I mean, before the pandemic even hit, there has been a food insecurity issue. And with the pandemic, it's really just heightened the issue. So we're like, what can we do as an organization? And we decided to just put together bags of produce that had recipe information and nutritional information in there. And we delivered it, delivered it to um, elder households with grandchildren and families for free. So, yeah, just more photos of this year of our crop. Um, We've grown a lot of just everything, really. A lot of commercial crops from squash, zucchinis, um, cucumbers, tomatoes, tomatillos, celery, peppers, um, you name it, we probably grew it. Um, so yeah, I just really wanted to show like what we're offering our community and the vendors that we support. So uh, the next pillar of Red Willow Center, which is near and dear to my heart, um, is our youth internship programs. So just to take it back a little bit, Red Willow was brought up as like to be a demonstration site for the Taos Pueblo community because we have such a short growing season in northern New Mexico. It's literally like two months or less. Um, you can get an early spring frost or a, like an early late uh, fall frost, anything. So it was really put here to show the Taos Pueblo people how to extend their season um, into getting an early start in the spring or well into the fall. And we're still very much maintaining the essence of that, of being a demonstration site for the Taos Pueblo people and a resource for them um, to learn about different agricultural methods. But since I've been the executive director, I'm really shifting the focus to the youth. Um, being a youth, <laughs> not so long ago once, I really understand what life can be like for young people in rural indigenous communities, and I just want to be here to help. Um, so these three are our first interns that we had in 2020 with the pandemic, like everything was crazy and we had to cancel and close a lot of things, but we slowly started to get our youth program going. So this um, on the far left is Bruce Bermudez um, in the middle is Aiden Suazo and on the far right is Jennifer Costa. And these were our three interns in 2020 and Bruce did a lot of work in researching a co-op and what it means to have a co-op, how they function. Um, Red Willow had a co-op in its previous years. Um, so we were just exploring what it meant and what it could do to help the Taos Pueblo community. Um, in the middle with, with is Aiden Salazzo and he was our like media um, intern and he did a lot more too of uh, farming, but he helped us put together um, videos and photos for our social media pages just to really get out the word of what we're doing. Um, so yeah, there he is just in our little staff meeting, <laughs> um, helping us plan this entire year. And Jennifer Casa was 
is amazing. She's still with us today and she came in just ready to work. She helped us uh, plant harvest with our farmer's market, with our youth program, everything. And yeah, she's just done so much. So these are just more photos of us working together. Um, we've had two youth programs. One was called the youth, um, the young cultivators program. And that was kind of more educational base, I would say, although everything we do is very educational. We just had more um, presenters coming from our village and surrounding villages to come and talk about agriculture and indigenous issues around land and water um, and education. But we also visited um, elder farms in our community and helped them out with just a lot of planting, um, any kind of labor that they needed. Uh, we also did just different um, activities with them, like food preservation, as you can see there, pickling, jams, drying. And we've invited our elders from the community to come and um, work with our kids with all of this. So this is just more photos of what our kids have been doing. Um, we're just trying to incorporate as much um, cultural learning as possible. And that's us just hiring people from our own community to come and teach the youth about um, drying, pottery work, all kinds of stuff. And what I really would am doing in our youth programs is just empowering our kids. Um, just, I know that everyone that comes into our program isn't involved in farming, but I like to see where our youth gravitate towards or like let us know what they like so we can really just empower them and be a great resource to them to help them out. Um, because I firmly believe that, and we all know that the youth are our future. They're the ones who are going to be taking over our job positions. They're gonna be the ones who are going to be our future leaders. And I just want to make sure that we're educating them not only about their culture, but issues that we have been talking about here today surrounding land, water, air, food, everything. Um, it's especially important to me to educate the kids in our community because they're the ones, especially the boys who will come into positions of leadership and I want them to be aware of these issues and um, just talk about them because they're going to be the ones who are going to be de making decisions about all of these things and I keep telling them every day like us and indi as indigenous people we hold all of these resources that colonizers want from us so there is going to be this ever going battle of that so we need to be well informed and just do what we can to protect what we have. And I find that educating children is the best way to ensure our future as indigenous people. So here's just more photos of like our young cultivators um, program. Uh, we just taught a lot about soil health, uh, planting, harvesting, um, getting ready for market, um, handling the market. So we had a lot of like money stuff going on a lot of financial literacy and I just love these kids like they're so amazing and they work harder than any adult that I have hired in my two years of working at Red Willow Center so it's amazing just to see how interested and involved they are in our work because I'm like yeah I'm ready for you to take my job as soon as possible <laughs> So just more photos of the work we've done with our kids we provide snacks for them all from the farm um yeah, we've just done so much and they've helped us with so much and we were, we're just able to move forward because of all of their help too. So right now um, we are just really, I think at a point after the two years of cleaning up the organization um, to be able to do more services for people in the community, um, I would very much like to have Red Willow be a place where we can host conversations around decolonizing and what does that mean and gender roles and trauma and how do we impact that trauma. Um, as a youth myself, like I found when I was very young, just going through so much, like dealing with everything you do as a teenager, but also like holding this historical and intergenerational trauma from knowing what has happened to indigenous peoples and what is still continuing to happen to indigenous peoples. And 
I just want to be here to be able to support any of these youth that are going through that. And even the adults in my community, I feel that we just need a safe place to talk, a safe place to talk about everything that we have been through as a people and what we are going through individually. Um, and the more we talk about it and are in those uncomfortable spaces, I feel the more we will be able to grow. Um, so besides the farm, the farmer's market, and our youth internship programs that we have, we do uh, just as much work as we can outside in our community. Um, so during the pandemic, when things were just crazy, <laughs> and we were like, what's going on with food? And we were having all of this rescue food like put out to our people. We we're like, let's just donate as much as we can. So we donated with within the Taos Pueblo to the senior center program, we've created our own food bag program. We had our farmer's market going where we were selling food at a very low cost. We also donated our food to the Little Bugs Daycare, St. James Food Pantry, um, an immigrant food hub, the women's shelter, men's shelter, like anywhere we could possibly like anywhere that took our food. We also supported other local farms like the Quest of Farmers Market um, and their youth program. We found that a lot of farmers during the pen, oh, now and even during the pandemic didn't have resources to safely wash and pack their food um, and store their food. So we allowed other organizations like Questa to be able to come and use our facilities. Uh, we also were in support of like different grassroots programs that popped up during the pandemic within Taos Pueblo. Um, I was also a part of this program and it was, it's the Taos Indigenous Women's Alliance. And it was a group of concerned men and women in our community that came together to really figure out what was going on in our community, especially during the pandemic. And we addressed education issues like internet and access and um, device access, as well as food. So one thing we did at Red Willow was provide produce and other food items to the Tiwa group to be able to make hot foods that we delivered to 80 families within the Pueblo. Um, so yeah, this is just more of what we've done. We've worked with the Habitat for Humanity um, with their volunteer services. They weren't able to do any kind of volunteering in 2020. So we went and helped them out in building houses and plastering and all of that. And they in turn came and helped us make hand washing stations and just different improvements around the farm. Um, I've also worked and required my employees to do different volunteering around um, Taos. So this is us at the St. James Food Pantry. Um, and we've also done like our own, um, I guess you would say they're not just food giveaways, but giveaways to families during the pandemic. So we worked with Tisuke Pueblo and the Traditional Native American Farmers Association in Tisuke Pueblo, as well as um, other small businesses around Taos to put together bags that had food, um, fresh and dried foods, as well as art supplies and different things that I felt people would need during the pandemic. Um, yes, there is a food crisis and we wanted to address that during the pandemic, but I also thought about the mental health crisis people might be going through. So we just wanted to prov provide other things other than food. So like art supplies and books and things. So we also did that during the pandemic. Um, so lastly, what we've been doing this year is we had a um, Community Shared Agriculture, a CSA. And this is a just kind of like a glimpse of what we had every week for our CSA members. And this was um, for people outside of the Taos Pueblo community. We had a large demand for people outside just asking for fresh, organic, local produce. And so we uh, um, use this model to help us really generate funds. Um, as you may all you all may or may not know, it's just difficult for nonprofits to get general operating support to pay people who are actually doing this work and to keep our lights on. So we decided to do a CSA of 25 members to help us generate that income to um, just pay uh, our kids, um, help out with our farmers market needs and help out with farm needs too. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really great. It really worked out for us. Our people loved it. And so we will be expanding our CSA to 40 shares next year, um, which is really exciting because we'll, that will generate money for us to use with however we wish. But we really put it towards our youth programs. We believe in equitable and just pay for our kids. So we've actually started at 
them at $14 an hour just to give them a good living wage. Um, and I believe that's part of youth empowerment too. So, um, yeah, this is just some of our flyers that we had for CSA and for our farm internship. We try to, to do everything as local as possible. So we worked with local artists, local graphic designers to just help us with this work. Um, but I'm more open to any kind of questions that you have just to learn more about me and the work that we're doing. Um, so yeah. And here are just some links to our Facebook and Instagram page and our website. Our Facebook is where we're most active. Um, and just some information of how you can donate to Red Willow Center. So texting blue corn to 44321 and anything and everything helps. And like I said, it mostly goes right directly to our youth programs to be able to pay our kids um, and to keep the farm going. So yeah, I didn't want to take up too much time. So I have sped right through that, but I really, really am looking forward to Lillian's presentation and I look forward to any questions that you may have. So thank you. Thanks so much, Tiana. That was beautiful. I loved all the photos and all the food looks amazing. Um, so I wanted to now move on to our final presenter for today, Lillian Hill. Thank you so much. It's just so great to hear um, and to see, you know, you, Tiana, and then also to hear from uh, Julia and Teresa and all the you know, amazing work that you all are involved in and engaged with and committed to. So Asquale, thank you guys so much for what you do. You know, I'm so proud of you, um, especially Tiana and you, all of you younger people who, you know, young women from our communities who are really standing up and, and being leaders. So I'm just, you know, wanting to encourage you as you move in your journey too. Um uh, my name's Lillian. Um, my Hopi name is Red Fox. I, I was named by the Water Coyote clan um, within my community. Um, I'm Tobacco clan and I come from the village of Kikotsmovi, which is located um, on the Hopi. Uh, in Hopi territory in Northern Arizona. <clears throat> Thank you so much for, um, for inviting me today. I'm uh, just gonna go through a few slides and to share uh, some of the work that I've been engaged with uh, within my own community and um, in hopes that that you know, continues this larger conversation that, um, that we're all involved in to build you know, a future for, for ourselves and our the next generations that we that are coming after us. So, um, so I'm going to share and hope that the technology gods are here with us today. Um, technology and I don't always, we're not always um, <clears throat> on the same page. Um, and so I'm going to share uh, the work of uh, two different organizations that I've um, helped to one one I helped to co found which is the Hopi Pitsqua Permaculture Institute. And the other is a new organization that I've just um, recently um, you know, become part of, which is the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. Um, and so, uh, <clears throat> so that's the work that I'm gonna share with you today. And so um, you know, within the community that I work with um, and that I'm actually a part of where I was born and raised, uh, we have strong you know, traditions as, as people who are close to the land as land stewards and those who have a, a spiritual responsibility to, um, to the land and to our teachings. And that um, is really who defines us as, as a people, as Hopi people. And so, um, <clears throat> so the organization that I helped to, uh, to found um, is really an organization that is using um, kind of the settlers, um, you know, language to do what we do best as true, you know, land stewards. Um, so the organization is a, is a nonprofit um, indigenous led group that's located in, um, in the village where I'm from uh, in Hopi. And the, our mission is really to create community-based solutions to pass knowledge to future generations and rebuild um, generative and healthy communities, um, which is basically our, you know, foundation and, and legacy as a people. 
And so I come to the work of nonprofits really, um, really through um, the opposite by not working within the lens of nonprofits. A lot of the work that I've been engaged with, um, you know, you know, as a as a community person, has been really outside of structures like nonprofits or LLCs or businesses. It's really been, you know, from a grassroots perspective. So. Uh, so this organization, um, Hopi Tetsukwa, is really um, <clears throat> kind of a newer nonprofit organization that incorporated in 2016. And so it's really kind of an experiment in, in seeing how these nonprofit structures can work and how they can, you know, um, serve, you know, the needs, emerging needs of the community. So, um, so, so really, you know, this, or this organization, this nonprofit is um, you know, led by folks from within the community. So it was really important um, for, you know, individuals who are involved to, um, to have statements of the work that we're doing, statements that really reflect our, you know, paradigm as a people. So we have, you know, definitely a commitment to heal um, and decolonize, you know, because as, as Indigenous people, as Hopi people, we've been interrupted in our, in our life plan um, and we've been interrupted by, as um, <clears throat> as Julia and others have mentioned, by this paradigm of of colonize, settler colonization and of real uh, destruction. And so I think part of um, this work and part of my work has been really to um, to heal and transform. Um, and this work really, um, you know, sits on the foundation of um, of a deep commitment to um, to resisting as well as to, um, you know, to really, uh, to be engaged in political activism on behalf of, of the land and to really continue work that um, our elders, my own elders have, um, have been involved with for a very long time. And so uh, the region where I come from is a region known as Black Mesa and it's, um, you know, characterized as an, uh, a national sacrifice zone as well, um, an area <clears throat> that has been heavily impacted by coal mining and water depletion. And so for myself as a young Hopi person, um, really trying to understand my purpose um, in my community and in the world in general, um, you know, I was definitely, um, you know, committed at a very young age to um, understanding, you know, how and why you know, we are so impacted, you know, not only by fossil fuel extraction, but also by, you know, the, the um, injustices that our communities face in term and those and how those injustices are um, translated and expressed within our within my community. And so being involved um, at a very young age, I helped to establish um, the Black Mesa Water Coalition and really supporting um, groups like the Black Mesa Trust who are already engaged in um, in work to end um, fossil fuel extraction in our community. And so from a traditional perspective, our elders tell us that any type of mining or, or violation of, of earth and of water um, and of the natural world, um, you know, goes directly against our spiritual relationship um, to, to the earth who we view as, um, as a living being, as, as kin or as our mother. Um, and so, you know, definitely being committed to that, um, to that work and, and still committed to this day and really, you know, helping to nurture, um, you know, resistance and also nurture the next generation who, you know, are, are committed and are standing up um, to these issues as well and, and against fossil fuel extraction. And so at a certain point um, in my own political activism as a young person, I felt that it's, it was important to be able to, to come uh, home, to be rooted in my own community and to really begin to understand, you know, my own uh, identity and my own responsibility as a Hopi woman, as a mother, <clears throat> as an aunt, as, as a godmother. And so really um, in retrospect, you know, this work is really part of a journey or a path or a migration um, understanding that we're born of this understanding that our ancestors have left us important knowledge of what it means uh, to care for each other and the world around us. Uh, and this includes the understanding of how we can, you know, continue to practice our culture, either as Hopi people or as 
Tewa people as, you know, um, people who come from the land and to find ways to evolve, you know, as a society from this, you know, degradation of what we as Hopi call um, which means life out of balance um, to a society of abundance and health. So, uh, so this, uh, you know, this organization is, is based on cultural values and comes from uh, the leadership of people like myself who understand that, you know, we are directly responsible for creating, you know, a resilient future for not only our generation and our children, but those who aren't here yet, those who are, you know, in process, you know, those who are sitting within, you know, our own wombs and our bodies right now. So this work is, <clears throat> is for them and to continue life. So, so that's really, I think for me, you know, my overall deep commitment is to um, ensuring and to supporting life and um, in a world that is like, is just so harsh, you know, in the world that is just overrun with this um, destructive force. And so, um, so really, you know, what does it take to, to move beyond that, you know, to move beyond this paradigm and to really see a future, you know, for, for those that are coming in, you know, <clears throat> in opposition and really with the idea um, and with the understanding that, you know, projections for the future are, are looking, um, you know, somewhat bleak in terms of climate chaos and, and this destructive force. And so <clears throat> really, um, you know, this work that I've been involved with through this organization and even you know, through just a, just a, a living commitment is to build um, community and to build capacity. So really looking within my own culture and, and the culture of my people to say, to see, okay, we have values like Namit Nangwa or Sumit Nangwa in our own language and paradigm, which basically means to help others or, or to provide support without, uh, without um, expectation or without you know, getting getting anything back, but just do, doing this because it's part of who we are to help each other and to cooperate and and really be there as as a loving and as a supportive community, um, as well as sharing skills and you know really continuing practices you know intergenerationally to strengthen uh, our own people um, and really you know I guess this this would be this is the framework is really to understand and to look beyond ourselves um, to those who are gonna come after us. So, you know, really um, part of our work is to ask questions, what would our communities look like if we nurtured the next generation to develop themselves, their leadership and their capacity to learn and practice our indigenous languages and our culture to strengthen and restore our food systems and our market, create, develop our own markets, rekindle our own trade routes and just be who we were, um, who we are meant to be. So um, a lot of this work and, and my commitment as well is, is to young people, um, like Tiana mentioned, really nurturing and providing, you know, um, support to, to the next generation. And so for this organization, the, the work, um, the body of work really involves uh, three different things, building uh, reciprocity and experience. So really providing, you know, um, a hands-on space for, for our community to foster, you know, um, the emergence of, of leadership, but also the emergence of, of stewardship of land um, and water. And so we do that through different avenues like pro educational programming, um, you know, uh, supporting, you know, <clears throat> the development of regenerative projects and, um, you know, really supporting local jobs, housing solutions, agriculture, and local economy. So part of my, um, my own fascination has been with structures, invisible structures, and how we can um, understand how these invisible structures and policies have been, have emerged actually to perpetuate, you know, white supremacy and to perpetuate, you know, this growing inequality and um, understanding how we how we fit into that, or how we've been impacted by that, and how we can um, begin to to understand not only those structures of inequality of systemic, 
you know, racism and, and all of all of these um, destructive forces and how can we begin to emerge by creating our own structures, our own systems. Um, and, you know, we've done that really through um, <clears throat> supporting indigenous food markets um, and food plant shares through, you know, supporting the emergence of, of local food co-ops in our community, um, as well as, um, you know, developing uh, financing or reciprocal loan um, financing for our community. So, you know, as, as a permaculture institute, we don't really do what, you know, Western um, permaculture institutes do, which is to provide, you know, the, the certification course. Really what we're doing is building and, um, you know, bringing in resources to support the growth and the stabilization of our community. And so um, a few years ago, we uh, received a gift, um, uh, a gift of funding to, um, <clears throat> to use in whatever way that we want it to use. And so we as an organization um, decided to create a loan financing program with the initial gift um, that we received. And so basically we developed um, a, a regenerative home ownership program as well as a construction and student um, natural building student apprenticeship program. And so we provide um, low interest loans uh, to individuals, low income individuals and families. Um, and we have uh, designed uh, passive solar uh, homes, uh, one bedroom to three bedroom homes that have um, the, uh, that, that have the incorporation of passive solar design, uh, year round food production, rainwater harvesting, um, off-grid solar systems and off-grid rainwater um, harvesting systems, residential and um, landscaping systems. And these homes are really um, designed and the intention of this work is really to design homes that serve um, almost as, as a landscape feature like a mesa or a mountain that um, shed water, that harvest, that regenerate the landscape around it and homes that are you know, fossil fuel free homes, homes that nurture and, and are part of, of the land and the ecosystem and homes that support the growth and the nurturing of families and of children and homes that are built by our own, um, <clears throat> by our own hands as a community, by our own intention and are built with local materials like earth and stone and, and wood. Um, and, and so they're very beautiful. And so um, so there's a few future initiatives that the organization is working on, including uh, raising funding and, and bringing in resourcing to support um, an Indigenous land steward fellowship to, uh, to support those who are, you know, committed and actively engaged in stewarding land and water and providing resourcing, um, not only monetary resourcing, but the development of networks and and strong support groups uh, for you know, our, our emerging indigenous uh, land stewards and those who have been committed to this work for a very long time as well. Um, also, we are involved in uh, the design and the planning uh, <clears throat> and the capital campaign um, development to build a regenerative learning facility um, and center within our own uh, community to begin to um, operationalize our visions of having our own spaces within our community to organize and, and to nurture um, this work moving forward, uh, as well as to, you know, to support the emergence of, of an Indigenous food and farming collective um, within our region, uh, extending to our tribal um, relatives uh, around us, the Diné, the Pueblos, the you know, the, the other tribes that are engaged in this work as well. So these are, you know, longer term, um, <clears throat> long, longer term, you know, issues and work that we're uh, wanting to be involved with. So, and wanting to support. And so really, you know, these are just photos of, of, of the land and the people who are nurturing it through farming practices that instead of, you know, being extractive or being, you know, um, techniques that pollute the earth, they do the opposite, they regenerate the earth and they protect it and, um, <clears throat> and also, you know, strategies to, um, to restore our springs and our watershed areas, you know, build markets, build our own homes and train our community members to do that, um, you know, restoring and putting in systems for 
for small scale, you know, high desert um, intensive food production areas. Um, and, and there's just so much, you know, work. And if you were here, you know, I could take you into the farms and the gardens and and taste, you, you know, to areas like springs to taste our water, you know, that is coming back after, you know, many, many generations of of uh, exploitation. Um, and so you're welcome to continue to check out our work website um, on our website or through social media as well. So I encourage you to to support and to, you know, keep, keep updated on the work as well. There's a lot of good things on the horizon. Um, and it's like a, a really harsh transition. Um, but I've recently entered um, another realm of work, which includes working with um, the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, who is dedicated to restoring food systems um, that support indigenous self-determination, wellness, and culture. Um, and so this, this work is really um, <clears throat> part of, you know, this larger um, movement within the indigenous uh, food sovereignty realm where um, committed leaders and uh, tribal leaders and tribal nations are um, actively working to restore their food systems and to restore their connections to, um, to, to our food waste that have sustained our communities for so long and those who are committed to, um, you know, to, to looking at um, and really challenging the, the political and the power structures and systems that prevent access for our communities, um, access in terms of um, hunting and fishing rights and access in terms of, of the privatization of, of land and water, which prevents our communities from restoring and from continuing our um, <clears throat> indigenous food foodways. Uh, and so this work is part of this larger uh, conversation and this larger narrative to support you know, indigenous seed sovereignty and the rematriation of, of our seeds and our sacred um, life ways. And so um, this photo is actually a photo from Tiana's community up in Taos, Pueblo, where Rowan and others from the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance host um, these large um, gatherings that rekindle, you know, connections between our tribal nations and provide, you know, spaces um, for us to you know, share our traditional uh, dances and our languages and our cultures, and also spaces to return seed that has been extracted and taken from our communities through, um, <clears throat> you know, through this colonial force that just is, is just continuing to take, take, take and continuing to possess and privatize. And so this work is super important because um, through NAFSA, you know, indigenous seed hubs are being uh, created in different uh, regions and parts of, of the so-called uh, United States that we're living in. And so, um, so this work is really, I think, emergent and there's a, a lot of space for, um, for not only the indigenous seed sovereignty, but, but also, you know, the food and culinary mentorship that centers indigenous foodways and indigenous uh, cooks and chefs and others who are uh, food producers who are engaged in this work as well. Um, and so this work is really part of, you know, this larger uh, narrative that's unfolding within our tribal nations and within our communities to really rebuild, um, <clears throat> rebuild our connections to um, our foodways, our connections to each other, and really to reclaim spaces and to reclaim land and to challenge this larger paradigm as well as to um, to build power within um, within our communities. So I encourage you to, um, you know, check out the initiatives and the work that's happening with NAFSA and, um, and to just support, you know, all of those who are on this panel as well, who are working to, um, you know, to, to challenge and to restore and build and nurture and to do, you know, the work that that needs to be done and the work that's going to continue to be done by the next generations that are coming after us. So, um, so I'm really happy to be here with you all today and to share this work and um, just look forward to uh, continuing the conversation too. So thank you. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, it was a beautiful presentation and um, thank you again to all of our panelists for for sharing your work and it's it was just so mesmerizing <laughs> to listen to all of you um 
and uh, to learn from your work and, and what you've been doing. Um, I, there, my head's kind of swirling about the intersections of all these, all these different um, initiatives and how they're centered, not only in um, you know, individual care and well-being, um, but also larger systemic uh, narrative shifts that, um, that are certainly needed at this time. Um, I do want to acknowledge that we are at time for the panel, and um, I am wondering if there might be an interest um, in some folks staying on to ask questions, um, and if the panelists have availability for that. Um, otherwise, I, I recognize that um, the people have been probably sitting for a while, so if, uh, if you need to go, I understand and really appreciate your time um, in coming here. So maybe I'll ask the panelists first if they have um, interest in staying on. <laughs> I'm for staying on. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. I can stay on a few more minutes for questions too. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, well, my questions feel very irrelevant now because you all answered them in your presentations in such such amazing ways. So I um, feel okay to open up the um, chat or if anyone <coughs> has questions that they would like to, to share, um, please feel free to. It looks like we have um, from Catherine Ingraham. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> well, this is just unbelievable what you have been talking about, uh, believably uh moving and uh powerful and interesting and smart and all these other aspects to it that are really terrific to hear from four you know four different perspectives um it's uh, um it's kind of it's really also very exciting in spite of its you know of, of the amount of work that it, it entails and what lays ahead and so forth um you know i have uh sort of more, I have a kind of abstract, I, I'm sure we all have like different relationships to this, but I have a fairly abstract relationship to it, of course, although I'm a huge lover of that part of the world, you know, the desert and so forth, semi-arid part of the United States um, and visit that very often. But it's, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm over, I, I, I go there because I love to see the rocks, you know, it's just it's the rocks alone for me are, are, are unbelievable. But it's, um, uh, but uh, another question for me is I'm so, I'm also really interested in land and, and something we're doing at the Royal Groom Institute is where we have this study tank thing. And the first question we were asking ourselves was about drought. And uh, we were looking at the lower basin of the Colorado River and so forth. Um, and so it's really kind of understood to be something where you just throw a question in and you see what happens more or less. Um, and the power of the questioning, I think is really important. So what, what comes to mind is the, the, t the territory, the land that uh, encompasses the, say the Navajo nation uh, or the Hopi nation uh, is, and other and other uh, indigenous settlements is is bounded, you know, in this kind of artificial way, and yet that boundary is all important to the integrity of the culture within. And so I'm wondering how that boundary is being rethought, you know. Uh, it, uh, in, I'm just talking about the physical territorial idea of the reservation, which is just kind of unbelievable, this idea of the reservation. It's kind of horrifying. And yet it's also a kind of protected zone in some way. And within that zone, horrible things have happened like this extraction and uh, exploitation. And I really, really understand that the Lillian's remarks about the failure and the damage and the, and the lack of care, you know, so, um, so I'm curious about how that boundary, what happens that boundary? What, do, what is the reservation need to be, take, the whole concept of a reservation is so loaded. Is it possible that that, re, that definition of the reservation will radically change it? I mean, outside of the boundary and inside as well. So I'd just be curious to hear different thinking about that. I, 
I can respond if um, no one. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you for your question. Um, I showed all the different. Uh, I, I like to like as a pedagogical in these maps, it's our little cartographies what uh, the settlers imagined our, our reservation boundaries to be. And as we know that these are not, um, have not always existed this way. Um, I mean, the fact that, for instance, like the Hopi reservation exists as a, as a like a discrete rectangle <laughs> in the middle of the Navajo nation just shows how, like how artificial that rendering is as opposed to our our actual imaginary of the landscapes and how we've lived on those lands for millennia is moving across, you know, this entire territory, um, sometimes in conflict and then sometimes, you know, working together. Um, so, yeah, I would just, in terms of like the history of the reservation system, you know, the Navajo Nation, its original, you know, 1868 treaty was very confined um, and we were able to acquire more more territory, you know, and as I said, these, these are overlapping mappings with other tribes in the region. Um, and so um, I would like to give one example of a way that I think indigenous communities are working to reimagine and push back on these colonial mappings that have been forced upon this. Um, and uh, my friend Janine Yazi, who uh, is amazing, she's done a lot of like on the ground work um, in the Navajo Nation. I'm sure many of you know her and her work, um, but she started the Little Colorado River Watershed Association. And part of that was to bring together like Diné communities um, around uh, the local watershed. So the Little Colorado watershed. Um, and I thought this was really radical in pushing back against even the, like our existing like chapter house system or like the local politics because it's imagining a collective around watersheds. Um, and I'm sure a lot of our other panelists can speak to those sorts of, um, you know, solidarities, you know, within their own communities and also our communities in, like, in general, you know, like Black Mesa Water Coalition and, you know, we all share the same watershed, um, you know, Hopi, Navajo. So, um, that's just one example that I'll give of like a way that we're, you know, communities are trying to push back on what these impositions are and to recenter indigenous knowledge. Um, I just want to say that's really interesting. We also look, we're looking at that question of the watershed as a more, a more, uh, um, uh, a more a smarter way of organizing, you know, uh, uh, water rights in a certain sense, so that it wasn't just a sort of a, a arbitrary establishment of rights to the use of the resources. That watersheds do define communities uh, who share, you know, the resources. Um, so I think that's really interesting. Interesting remark. Um, I, I I don't want to talk anymore. I want to hear other people, but I just wanted was also wanted to tell you about this uh, book that I was reading recently for this class I'm teaching that and it's about the it's it's um because I sort of also teach uh, philosophical uh you know sort of things uh periodically that it was really it's a book written by a uh African critic really who is talking about slavery and at and he's written this book called the, you might know about it, called The Critique of Black Reason, you know, and it's actually in connection with the European, you know, Kantian critique of pure reason. And he's looking at reasoning as a whole different system of reasoning um, uh, that is uh, has, and he mentions, the reason I bring him up here is he mentions the question of care in a very interesting way. You know, he's sort of, and it, it's associated in his mind, with uh, the, that that you know, the sort of Eurocentric ordering of the world uh, was also associated with commodification and you know, making people objects, you know, that could be uh, given certain values, and so they wouldn't be, you know, so you couldn't, you didn't see them as whole, and uh, that these systems of ordering were responsible for. Uh, 
we're responsible for sort of uh, uh, the possibility of treating people badly, you know, because uh, they'd be thinking thought of as an object and you would just sort of shuffle around people, you know, and you, you know, privilege certain people and not other people and so forth, which is interesting. It's like, I mean, different, different kinds of order, I think is what many of you have been talking about, ordering uh, according to indigenous principles. And it's a and it's and and the order has been disrupted, as I think Lillian said, in a very, very good way. And so that the disruption has created damage, and people need to recover, you know, personally recover and community recover and recover the reasoning, the system of reasoning. Anyway, I'll stop. But I just um, that's what I'm coming to mind here. Julia, I'm sorry, I didn't inter um, I just wanted to know if you wanted to say anything else in relation to the original question, or um, I can move on and ask some other questions. Um, I, you know, I think Teresa did an excellent job of explaining how um, these geopolitical borders have really hindered um, effective and reciprocal and respectful land management practices. But I think the last thing I'll tack on is, you know, I think you were kind of alluding to um, systems in terms of values. You know, there's there's a lack of value in the system that we currently live in because, you know, it's about creating surplus. It's about exploiting people's labor. And it's not really anything around um, giving back or being reciprocal with land, which is much of what Lillian was talking about, um, which is just innate and within like Pueblo perspective and worldview. And so, you know, how do we as indigenous people communicate with um, the dominant paradigm. And so sometimes it has to be in, in terms of, well, if we're going to look at full watershed management, maybe that's a more equitable way of managing, you know, resources on this landscape because, you know, the movement of water really does challenge these jurisdictional boundaries anyway. And so somebody that has a jurisdiction of the headwaters may manage differently than somebody does downstream. And so if we're not looking at the system as a whole, as a whole, I mean, we're essentially, you know, severing arteries here, and it's going to end in, in chaos, which it actually is, which is why I feel like we're dealing with climate crisis right now. And so um, that's why I think all of us really do emphasize this resurgence of Indigenous identity, not just in terms of spirituality, but how we're living with the natural world instead of against it. And you can see that in many different um, respects. I mean, I was in Chaco Canyon this morning and the structures that our ancestors built are essentially going to return back to the earth. And that's a pretty sustainable way of building architecture. Um, and so, you know, I, I think everybody spoke to that today. And it's just, again, this constant um, unlearning, uh, undoing, relearning um, that, we, that we have to do. And also just some open-mindedness to really understand like why indigenous people harp on like, you know, worldview so much, because um, it, it really can benefit everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I also just want to want to add to that and mention that, you know, our spatial imaginary as as indigenous people <clears throat> is in, you know, definite stark contrast to the spatial imaginary of the white space to of, of white supremacy and how pervasive white supremacy has impacted, you know, uh, not only us as indigenous people, but the structures and the policies and the land tenure systems that uh, continue to perpetuate white supremacy as well. And so within, you know, our, or within, I can speak for myself, but even collectively as, as indigenous people, you know, we do have our uh, ima spatial imaginary that includes and that, uh, you know, emphasizes that we and the land that our ancestors have, you know, walked and left footprints on uh, is deeply embedded within our songs and our ceremonies and rituals and ways of life so that we can continue to you know not only imagine but live in those spaces not only physically but within you know our our upbringing and our stories so our the next generations they're connected to those spaces and the more and more that we um, as cultural practitioners 
continue to access and go to those spaces to leave offerings to collect and gather. Um, that's, you know, um, part of our responsibility in our way that we continue to caretake land beyond the political borders and beyond, you know, these power structures that continue to uphold, you know, this broader, um, you know, this broader ideology um, of white supremacy that continues to privatize and continues to control, you know, our, our experience as well, our collective experience. So, <clears throat> so you know, as, as an Indigenous person who, you know, lives in this world um, that has definitely been built structurally for white people, my experience is different. Um, and these structures and systems of land tenure and of reservations are then, you know, uh, these policies are reinforced through military by militarization and by the police. And so, you know, that's also my experience and also my concern being a mother of a son who is a, a cultural practitioner who goes on the land and does pilgrimages and, and does conservation work and has to move through this white spatial imaginary you know, of him, you know, and, and the extreme racism that we face as well as Indigenous people, you know, this is real, this is our reality. And so, you know, as, um, you know, so your question has a lot of implications. And as an Indigenous person, as a mother, you know, I, I see the implications um, <clears throat> for us as Indigenous people to assert our right to the land and to assert our stewardship um, of the land and, and having, you know, the response be, um, you know, a, a response that that is continually um, negative, I think, for our communities, you know, that's a reality for us, too. Thank you so much, panelists, for your um, responses. Um, I wanted to ask uh, and this kind of builds on, on things that you've already been talking about, but going deeper into this um, this um, element of rematriation. Um, and uh, uh, for those who are less familiar on the call of what this might be, um, I've in my work heard of many ways of thinking about that con um, concept, especially in contrast to repatriation, which is about the return um, of something to the original owner. So it's thinking about things in terms of ownership, whereas um, rematriation is um, thinking about the return of belonging to one place, one's place of origin. Um, and uh, my indigenous friends and colleagues in Canada have also spoken about it in relation to the um, restoration of the role of women and their purpose that they belong to in the community. So I was wondering if um, you could talk about what rematriation look, work looks like um, further kind of in your community or in your work related to land, food and water issues. And um, yeah, and how that might be, how that might shift and um, help to inform how we change the current systems that we're operating in. I, I can speak on that just a little bit. And of course, if um, Teresa or Tiana want to jump in, that's awesome. I know Lillian had to jump, but, um, you know, I, I have actually been on this, my own sort of journey in terms of understanding how to communicate this idea of resurgence of like personhood or indigenous identity into non-human relatives or, you know, like waterways. So, you know, the, the more famous example is in um, Eo Tierra, the, you know, they, they asserted human rights on their river. Um, and so, you know, we, and, you know, we're also dealing with these other concepts in terms of gender identity and non-binary identities and two-spirit identities. Um, and so I feel like rematriation is really more of sp like spirituality and but also like characteristics. So when when we talk about 
um, rematriating water management strategies. And, you know, to me, that really means to reassert this type of thinking that allows for us to look at waterways as living entities, um, to speak to the connections that birthing bodies have to water as well. And then the type of matrilineal roles and systems that we have in our communities um, that are traditional. And, and so um, I just feel like we as indigenous people come from many matrilineal systems and they've allowed for that voice to be more centered centered rather than like this white patriarchal uh voice that has dominated every single sector i mean if you look at all of the sectors that we represent in terms of food or water or land um geography whatever it is um they're predominantly white male um fields and so you know, we talk about rematriation in the sense that we must return to what the original instructions are of these territories, because that's the only way that we're going to solve the issues that we're experiencing. So it's a challenge because it's then also challenging us to think of these indigenous concepts in in another language, in English, you know, and sometimes it doesn't always get conveyed. Um, and I think that's just, you know, the challenge walking in this life as an indigenous person anyway. Um, but I think it's insanely important to center thinkers that talk about rematriation, whether that's in food, whether that's in government systems, water systems, whatever. Um, because, you know, we're 500 plus years in terms of colonization, which really isn't that long if you compare it to like our existence as indigenous people on this landscape. But it's generations of undoing that need to happen. Um, and so as long as we can continue having and centering conversations around rematriation, have discussions, have debates, um, sleep on it even, <laughs> I think that's a good start. We don't have the answers yet, but we're definitely coming together and spaces like this are great because, you know, I know of, you know, Lillian and Teresa and Tiana, but now have the opportunity to maybe converse a bit more about how we're going to center conversations around re rematriation. So that's what I'll that's what I'll add to that. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I just want to ask one que final question, and we can wrap up. Um, about just since many of you work with young people um, and uh, I guess I'm you know more and more we're, we're youth are um, their voices are being elevated um, more and more especially given that um, you know this is it's their world that they're inheriting that is um, at, at stake and so I guess I'm wondering um, from your perspectives, you know, and the, with the work that you're doing with the youth and um, as young people, you know, what are some, some things that you would want um, adults currently alive at this time to know and how might we make space to listen to young people without imposing adult values, um, ideas or uh, worries that um, onto, onto uh, their own, their own imaginings for the future. If that makes sense. Thanks, Teresa. So to Thanks, Teresa. Thank you so much. Thank Honestly. you. So sorry. Okay. Oh, you're fine. It was great okay. meeting you. <laughs> yeah. No, I loved it. It was really awesome. I loved your presentations. Um, I hope I can be in touch with both of you after this. <laughs> Yeah, no, I would actually, I was going to kind of go off of Julia too and say like, it's great that we're all here um, presenting together to really learn together because I would really love to connect with both of you to have you come and present to our youth about these issues and just get them more informed and get them to think and get them to like wake up. So like they're constantly thinking about these issues that are 
affecting Native people and see what they can do to help. So it's really just so amazing and wonderful to meet you guys. And I hope we can connect more in the future. Awesome. Thank you. Nice mm -hmm. meeting you. Thanks, Teresa. Nice to meet you too. Okay. Bye. Bye. Um, but going back to the question, I honestly think that we just need to listen. That's all we need to do is just listen to youth and just be a part of their lives. Like um, at the farm, like we just work together. Like it's really hard to get um, indigenous kids to just open up right away. So we kind of take things really slow and we work together and get them to build trust. And I think that's the first thing, first and foremost, to really get them to talk about anything really it's just to build that trust with them and um we just do that very slowly by just getting to know them little by little and I find that like when we're in the garden doing work or weeding or whatever that's when students or youth really just open up about what they're feeling or what they're dealing with or any issues that they want to talk about but I mean it's just it's as simple as that it's just listening and being there and you know, being open-minded and not judgmental towards them and having them understand that too. So it really, it just comes with trust building first. And with that, it becomes with being consistent, you know, and always being there and just listening. <laughs> so I'll keep it at that. Thank you. All right, well, thank you so much, um, Julia and Tiana for staying on and for fielding some questions and for um, just all the amazing work that you're doing. Um, I really appreciate your participation in this panel and for, um, yeah, just for being here and for everything that you do. And um, I want to just flag some announcements um, in, in uh, moving forward. So um, Field Stations uh, has a final um, speaker event on November 10th, as, um, as Lee had mentioned on um, extraction and understanding the impacts of extraction in the Southwest. And um, also to be on the lookout for um, applications for the summer program um, coming up this winter. So. Those are my two kind of general announcements. And again, I just really want to thank you, um, both of you for your knowledge and um, sharing your work and um, yeah, just for, for everything really. Um, so thank you so much. And thank you to everyone else for staying on for a little bit longer. So I really want to thank everyone and thank you guys for at least providing a platform for all of us to speak about the work that we're doing, because that's how we're getting the word out and getting support. So thank you guys, too, for, you know, thinking of us and inviting us here to speak. And thanks for just listening, because a lot, really, a lot of the time, we just need people to shut up and listen. <laughs> and, you know, that's how we'll all learn and work together. That's so what my husband guys. always says. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, we're also happy to always share your work on our social media platform. So if you have anything that you'd like to share, please just get in touch and we're happy to post it out through our small networks and hopefully then other people will post that out too. So we just grow that uh, sharing platform. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Thank you, everybody. That Bye, was really everyone. wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Good night.